Joining me now from our London studios to discuss this is a rice business analyst, Bode Oshosami. Bode, good afternoon. It's good to see you again. Now, there was a press conference by Gossen's lawyer today after the court appearance. What do we know and how are the markets reacting to this? Well, I think it's uh, quite a spectac spectacular downfall, mm -hmm. indeed, like you rightly uh, said. And um, the, the markets are a bit mute, given the fact that um, we know that uh, Nissan's shares have, have been down about 10% or so since November when this story first broke. Today, there wasn't very much movement. Renault's shares have been down uh, about 14% uh, since the, uh, the, um, uh, the story uh, broke. But today, we saw their shares go up just uh, slightly. But uh, to your question, indeed, um, the, the Carlos Gerson appeared in court actually appeared for the first time. We hadn't seen him, and mm -hmm. the, obviously his appearance was uh, a bit uh, worrisome to, to quite a few who, kn who knew him, whether he was quite well. But I think that the problem or the, the challenge here is he's saying that he's innocent and um, his lawyer is saying he may be spending six months even before uh, the trial uh, begins, talk less of when the trial uh, ends. And mm -hmm. it's quite unusual that he's not been given uh, bail. He said he did not uh, misstate uh, his, mm -hmm. his, his uh, compensation and uh, he claimed the supposed uh, amounts were for deferred compensation uh, amounts that there were no binding contracts and not monies that he had actually collected These were for future payments mm -hmm. that had not been completely agreed. There may be a loophole that he may have found there. And also, mm -hmm. with respect to the so-called um, taking on or passing losses to, to uh, Nissan, he again uh, denied that indeed there were temporary situations where it was agreed that a collateral uh, with respect to certain derivatives transaction be passed on to Nissan. But this was done at, not, uh, at no loss to Nissan, and it was agreed mm -hmm. to stop his resignation, which would have been uh, what he would have had to do mm -hmm. if he had to use his retirement allowances to meet those uh, obligations. And I think largely you can see that he has a story to, to tell. That's mm -hmm. the important thing. And um, the reactions of Nissan, the, the Nissan boss was interviewed. He didn't say anything. What is still very surprising is Renault has not removed um, Carlos Gerson as their chairman and chief executive, even as of today, which means having heard all the details from uh, uh, Nissan, they're still convinced that uh, he's innocent and he needs to be proven uh, guilty before they take any action. They obviously mm -hmm. are saying they have not seen anything wrong in what he, he has done. So obviously th there may be uh, some, some truth to what he's saying. We just have to wait. It's uh, a bit unfair that he has to stay so long behind bars. Even mm -hmm. with the French government, we understand um, supposedly given a guarantee that they would make sure that he appears in court. Apparently that wasn't good enough for the Japanese authorities. But the, the whole issue about the possibility of a power grab is all over the media, particularly because uh, everyone knows Gosun was negotiating a, a Nissan uh, and um, Renault merger, which obviously Nissan wasn't very pleased uh, about. And um, the, the, this summer saying this is a way to stop that, that merger or mm -hmm. frustrate that merger or at least shake up the alliance so that Nissan can rearrange it uh, more to their advantage. So I think there's a lot that has to be uh, examined. It's also worrisome that Nissan has also been charged. That means they also have a case to answer. Obviously, you can't mm -hmm. expect these things to all have happened without some collision within the Nissan organization, particularly at the board level. So we have to wait to see how all this unfolds. Well, Bode, we have um, Gozan generally saying that he's innocent and insisting, you know, that he's done nothing wrong. But you also have Nissan's Saudi partner defending him. Can you explain this? Well, yes, there was indeed um, a Saudi businessman, Khalid Al Jufali, who was supposed to have uh, collected about four, $14 million from Nissan for offering services which um, many said were for personal use to arrange a letter of credit. But he, he has come up with a statement that these were official uh, expenses uh, mm -hmm. for for Nissan and nothing uh, to personal to, um, uh, to to Carlos Gerson and of course being an independent uh, person making this kind of uh, testimony on behalf of Gerson strengthens his his position. Well, although it's not uh, un unusual for third parties that are friends or are partners to mm -hmm. companies where the, the chairman has had a very long relationship uh, with them to make these types of uh, 
uh, testimonies, but of course they wouldn't be misrepresenting the situation because that could come with very serious uh, repercussions on them. So I think one can believe this, this story. We have to wait and see the, the response, particularly from Nissan, whether more charges would actually be, be, be leveled because we understand that there, there are presumably more charges that they haven't actually brought out yet. So let's wait and see what happens. Well, Bode, so what happens next now? Are there any lessons so far that we can take away from this entire situation? Well, I think the big lesson for me is, is governance, particularly at the board level. If mm -hmm. Nissan had uh, robust board processes, for example, you, you would normally have a board compensation committee, some, a committee that looks at, at board affairs, particularly their compensation. Anything related to a board member has to be uh, handled very delicately with proper legal coverage and with independence. So you will have a board committee uh, headed by an independent director, obviously not the chairman, mm -hmm. who will be able to uh, scrutinize many transactions before they, they, they go through. The, the sense we have is that Nissan was uh, behind uh, the, the, the standards generally as far as board governance was concerned and decisions were taken uh, in a way that uh, really didn't, uh, wasn't quite as it should be. Mm -hmm. And they got away with it over, over the years. Obviously, Nissan has a motivation for now uh, bringing out all the skeletons in the closet, but uh, you, you, the, the way to protect your organization from these t types of problems would have been to have very strong governance, mm -hmm. uh, to oversee board matters, to vet board issues, and to ensure, particularly the chairman and very important members in the board are not abusing their position in one way or the other. And particularly not just to say they're not abusing their position, but you have a third party to establish that uh, the highest levels of ethics uh, uh, are, are being uh, practiced in anything related to procurement involving board, board members and so on. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there could be all kinds of abuses. So obviously these, I don't think uh, Nissan really focused on this. They, 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 they focused must have been just on profits and uh, get, turning around the company. And we have to give Carlos Gerson the credit for spending, as he said, two decades of his life turning around and reviving Nissan. But he should have been smart to protect himself with strong uh, governance processes as well to forestall these types of uh, issues because it's not quite clear what's happened and he's going to spend almost a year in jail even before uh, wow. the, 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 the case is, is finally decided. Well, Bode, thanks so much for joining us again and for shedding more light on this issue. Arise business analyst there, Bode Oshosami.